new paradigm for blockchain node architecture. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO, and Dr. Kishori Kanwar is uh, CTO, also co-founder. We actually have been working on this tech for a long, long time, about a dozen years, uh, and here we are now. Um, so what is Optimum, and why do we care? So let's start with what makes a network successful. Um, and, you know, I'm going to argue that it's the socket, you know, the humble socket. That's what makes a network successful. So if you think of, you know, networks that have really stood the test of time, what you have is you have some messy network with lots of different nodes and lots of different things happening, but you have an abstraction that works and that's easy to plug into. So if you think of the electric grid, I have the socket. I don't need to worry about, um, you know, whether I'm pulling from a solar panel or something else. I have a socket and it looks to me like a uh, battery. If you look at Web 1 and Web 2, we have the transport socket. Uh, TCP IP, UDP, I would argue Quick is also a socket. Uh, and that's how the whole thing is able to work for us. Uh, so it's an abstraction that makes a network look like a dedicated uh, resource. So in uh, the electric grid, basically, it's going to look for me like a dedicated battery, right? I can't tell that. OK, forget the AC or DC problem. It's basically going to look to me like there's a battery uh, dedicated to me, even though you know there's a solar panel, there's you know a coal fire plant or whatever. Um, if you look at Web two, say Web one, also I have some messy multi-hop uh, connection here, but as far as I'm concerned, there's a dedicated link between one node and another node, right? And that's what the socket gives. So there's two things: the abstraction, and behind it, there has to be some technology to make the whole mess that is this cloud satisfy the emulation of that abstraction, okay? All right, so do we have that in Web3 right now? We don't really, right? We, we don't have that abstraction. I mean, there is an abstraction in some sense that you know, all of Web3, it wouldn't be great if just it just looked to me like a computer. Like if I didn't have to worry about the fact that it's Web3 versus, you know, how we learn to program on our own computers. So what does our abstraction do? So the Optimum Data Socket is going to emulate memory access on a dedicated machine, okay? So what this means is that I have a node accessing a variable, a block, and as far as it's concerned, for the read writes, it's the same thing as if it had its own RAM connected by its own bus, right? It's my computer, I have my RAM, I have my bus, I don't need to worry about everything else, right? So when I program, I don't go around going, gee, I wonder where my memory is. No, it's in my computer, I don't need to worry about it. I have abstractions that manage it. Okay, so, what does it actually mean for me to have my own computer? What does it mean for me to have my own machine? So first is the memory is not flaky. I'm not reading and writing to the same memory cell at the same time. It's atomic. The other thing is, remember, I have my dedicated bus. Reads and writes on my bus don't go jumping around and changing order of their own accord, right? As I put them on my bus, thus they are serviced. My reads and writes are ordered automatically in the way in which they happen. So that's consistency. And thirdly, it shouldn't be flaky. Right? So I turn on my computer, and unless something's gone terribly wrong, I don't worry about, OK, this was a two-week-old two uh, blob or two-year-old blob. It should be in there. I have to be able to access it. Okay? So these three elements, atomicity, consistency, durability, are often seen in the context of what we call the ACID framework. 
uh, those three elements are basically what we what we want in order to really duplicate the effect of what a dedicated machine does. So, you know, if you go and look it up on uh, on Wikipedia, it's interesting, right? So this comes back from like the 80s, you know, when uh, IBM was really trying to figure out what does it mean to have a machine? What does it mean to when I tell you you have a machine that's working, right? The I came in later, by the way. So even though it's often called it, it the ECD came first. And the I, which is isolation, is actually about the particular functions that you do, the particular uh, ways in which you're using the data. But we don't worry about that because right now we're just worrying about the reads and writes. How exactly you then operate on these reads and writes is not something that we're concerned about. However, we should be concerned about the fact that I should probably plug this into a socket. Okay, <laughs> okay. So let's think of the transport socket. You know, why, why, is, it, uh, why is it successful? I'm not going to do the seven. OSI layers, I'm going to take the simplified sort of internet, uh, you know, like the, you know, IETF Internet uh, Engineering Task Force look, application transport network hardware, right? We know that there's other layers. So what does the socket do for us? What the socket does, it allows applications to basically get into the part that's going to be going from the transport into the network, right? So the socket is literally that. I'm being able to plug into, uh, into, the, into the transport layer. And something like QUIC is instantiated in, the, in user space, but it's, it's basically also a socket on a socket, right? It's like when I come here uh, to, to Singapore, I need to have you know, a socket in a socket because I need an adapter. Right, so, so think of Quick as an adapter. It's uh, you know, here's Quick. All right, um, and then you know that's what gives us our interface. Okay, what does it mean for me to have a socket of the kind that I just described that's giving me read-write access? What does that mean in the context of Web three? So here we have you know the different layers. You could uh, some people might say, well, you need to have a DA layer there. That's that, that's fine. But let, let's go with these layers for the time being. You know we we can all agree on those. All of these layers, one may talk to the next, but all of them eventually have to get to the data layer. Okay, and basically what we're doing is we have an optimum data socket that everything can talk to to get into the data layer. So that read-write, that is the abstraction of having a socket uh, in the data layer. And what does a socket do? The socket reads and writes. Sometimes I get asked, well, what about data availability? Well, data availability is a proto-read. It's to check that the data is there, right? That if you wanted to read it, you could do so, which, you know, fair enough. But is the available, you know, it's a question of whether a block is available. So this is what we're doing. We're doing reads, we're doing writes, we're doing atomic, we're doing consistent, we're doing durable reads and writes. Okay. So people have been looking at doing this you know, for, you know, let's say since the 90s at the very least, you can argue exactly even started when. And there are some algorithms that provide ACD, okay? Um, the ABD algorithm, probably the best known. Uh, we have to be a little bit more ambitious and a little bit more careful when we're talking about Web3 because we have a permissionless system. What does that mean? nodes are going to come in and out. So you have to pretend, you have to be able to pretend that the world is a stable, dedicated machine, while not just you don't know exactly what Web3 looks like, but on top of that, it's changing as you speak, and you can't stop people from coming and leaving because that's what permissionless is. Okay? At least that's not something we generally have to do with Web2, right? I don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, you know, uh, a router left. You can argue about that too. So there were some algorithms that provide ACD. There was a small little handful of algorithms that also provided reconfiguration, so the ability to have nodes, you know, wander in and out. The problem 
there is cost. You know, algorithms like if you're in the, in the area like Rambo and so on. Those algorithms were all based on replication with huge memory cost, huge bandwidth cost, a whole lot of communicating back and forth, getting consensus, and a huge amount of delay from that back and forth in order to keep state. So what are we going to do? We want the ACD. We want the reconfiguration. But we don't want to have this sort of overhead. When we started working on this uh, with Nancy Lynch, um, I can show you about a dozen years ago, the rationale was the following. We wanted to have something that was worst case guaranteeable, that had all of the guarantees of something like Rambo, of true ACD, but that in the average case was not going to be too expensive, right? Most of the systems out there in the distributed systems, you know, Everything's proven perfectly, pen and paper, great, for worst case. But then you're always operating like it's the worst case, right? So you're designed for the best worst case, and you operate for the worst case, even when the worst case doesn't happen that often. So what we want is something which has all the guarantees of worst case, but on average, it's cheap. So how can I keep those guarantees on average be cheap? You have to use coding. And you can't just use any coding. We'll talk algebraic coding. Because this permissionless system, basically that reconfiguration, I'll show you that in a second, means that as nodes are coming in and out, I'm not going to have some sort of master node from which everything comes. So I need to use coding to make optimum use of storage, optimum use of bandwidth, but and remove state dependency, but I need to have a coding scheme which will be able to perpetually code upon codes upon codes, sort of perpetually uh, keep itself going uh, in a completely, completely decentralized way. And that's the other thing, right? Normally, if you think of coding, you think of structured codes. Here, if I'm going to truly be completely reconfigurable, completely decentralized, my algorithm for coding will also need to be completely distributed and decentralized. So just you know, high level, and for, uh, apologies for many of you who I know are very familiar in the, in, uh, in the audience. So what's the difference between sh uh, sharding and coding? So sharding, you take the data, you chop it up into different pieces, P1 through P5, and then you have to reassemble it, OK? And two P1s do not substitute themselves for missing P2. So you get into the problem that we often describe as you know, the coupon collector problem, where you're going around looking for the last thing, or the straggler problem. And that's what's really dominating your delay. It's not you know, getting the first piece. You get the first piece very quickly. But then it's you know, finding the last missing piece. What we do with coding is we do algebraic mixtures, which is you know, what, these, <laughs> what these little mosaics are trying to look like. And what's unique to randomly network coding is that you can actually take mixtures of mixtures. You don't need to start from the original data. You can take mixtures of mixtures and create valid mixtures by working, in effect, over large enough finite fields where the, the, the field has enough um, elements has enough cardinality. And in that case, with very high probability, if I take, if I have five pieces that I need to reconstruct, any five mixtures will do. So these five mixtures are congruent to the original data. Okay? And it's very, very easy to reconstruct. It's highly parallelizable because it's in effect just doing Gauss Georgian elimination. Okay, so what does that mean with respect to? actually being able to run a network. Remember what we wanted is the ACD worst case uh, reliability, which we basically have borrowed all of the techniques from that literature. But we also wanted to have something which was cheap and which was going to allow us to have a whole messy permissionless infrastructure that we could then rely on. So here's our idea in the optimum flex node. Here are the original pieces. Say here I'm having eight pieces rather than uh, the five that I showed you before. I want to reconstruct them. 
I just go to different flex nodes. So down here in the middle, I have my flex nodes. And these C's here are just these combinations, those little mosaics that we showed before. So I have C1 through C8, they're just linear combinations. I call upon whatever nodes are available, whichever ones can respond most quick, most quickly. I do that in a perfectly uh, distributed and completely decentralized, not distributed, actually fully decentralized and completely uh, on the fly manner. So this is totally opportunistic. Once I get my eight pieces, remember, as long as I have enough pieces, I have the data and I can reconstruct the original data. This is very fast. We're talking order of milliseconds. Now, what happens when, because I have a permissions on the system, a new node comes on and I need to spin up? I need to spin up a new node. Well, remember that composability of our LNC, which other codes don't have. I cannot take a Reed Solomon code, take a few pieces of it, encode it, and get another piece that's a Reed Solomon code piece. That's not how it works. I have to always start from the beginning. Right? So this is the only composable code. So you can see the lower cost because these nodes are very flexible, right? Some of them have three equations, some of them two equations, whatever they can have, that's great. You can see the retrievability because I read fast. You know, I'm not looking for like a full node. I just read for whatever's available. So it's sort of automatically parallelizing in an optimal on the fly way. You can see the decentralization. And you can see that when I need a full node, I just ask at this, uh, when, I need a, when I need a new flex node, I ask the other flex nodes, hey, just give me some equations. So what does this node do is creating a new equation out of whatever equations has available. This node is creating a new equation out of whatever equations has available. The total amount of bandwidth that's needed to spin up this node is minimum. It's just three units, and I cannot get by with less than three units, given that that node is going to store three units. What about our data availability, you may ask? Well, data availability is just sampling and checking whether, with a code, whether a node says, has what it says it has. I can do the same thing. I can say, hey, what code do you say you have? They say, well, you know, I have a code that corresponds here to C11, and they go, okay. Uh, well, if that's the code that you say you have, let me go and check if that's indeed the case. And, you know, a light node can check and goes through a full node. So this part doesn't change, except that it's actually even more powerful than, you know, again, the status quo um, codes that are out there right now. Okay? So minimum amount of memory, minimum amount of transmissions, this is why it's optimum. Now, one of the things that, you know, keeping the atomicity and consistency here is not easy, but maybe you can imagine how to do it. Maybe the most difficult to accept part is the durability. Okay, you can see how you might be able to keep atomicity here. You're like, okay, it's a lot of work, but I can believe you. Consistency, again, a lot of work, but I can believe you, right? The durability, you're like, Mural, things are coming in and out. Really, you think this is going to be durable? How's this going to be durable? So let's do the following experiment, because I think that, you know, well, different people might think different parts are more tricky, but the durability a priori looks like, you know, the one that beggars belief the most. So let's do the following experiment. Let's have, you know, some blocks. We distribute them across different nodes, and we're going to have nodes randomly go down. Now, of course, if you only ever have nodes go down, you know, eventually you have no network, and of course, you no longer have durability. So you need new nodes to come on, and these new nodes are just going to attach randomly to whatever nodes are available and willing, okay? So it's a completely permissionless, randomly killing nodes, nodes randomly coming in and just spinning up, spinning up like I showed you before, just pulling equations from whatever's available at the time, whoever's willing and available. Does it make sense? Okay? So this does not look like a recipe for durability, right? This is like mayhem. Completely decentralized. Nobody, nobody's keeping track of anything, right? People coming in and out, 
and just spinning up with some random equations and getting on with their life. Okay, here's the um, here's the animation that shows you what's going on. Now I have three axes. On the x-axis, bandwidth, total bandwidth of connections. Remember, like we had a bandwidth of three before when we were pulling from three nodes. Storage slash memory per node. So we want to, of course, be as small as possible on the x, y plane, on the horizontal plane. Reliability is the only one we want high. Reliability, we want to be at one. The low one, it means, you know, you go, oh, 0.9 reliability isn't that nice. No, that means that 10% of your time you lost your data. That's not good. That's not durable. So what you can see here with the current infra, if I shard, these are, by the way, rounds. So I don't know if you can see the counter of the rounds. If I shard, even though my cost is going up, eventually, just very quickly, my system dies. Okay, So I cannot be durable in this completely decentralized way with sharding. It's not going to happen, right? So let's not even try to do a CD without either you're going to have, everybody is going to have to have a full node, which is not going to be nice for your cost, and it's not going to scale, or you're going to die quickly. Look, however, what's happened with Optimum. It's alive. So this completely, you know, chaotic, a priori, you know, looking like a recipe for disaster is actually durable. You can prove this, of course. You know, I'm just showing it to you here. You can prove it. Um, but, you know, this is just one of the aspects that shows what we can do. Okay. So, um, my half hour is almost up, and I want to leave a little bit of uh, time for, for questions. So, this is what we do. We're turning Web3 into a truly decentralized machine built on top of network coding. I showed you one aspect, which is the durability. Uh, you know, there are many other aspects around speeding up um, uh, consensus through coded uh, gossip, algebraic gossip, and so on. You know, not showing you the whole thing, but the point is, you know, something that looks a priori to be so completely decentralized and so completely ad hoc that you know it it, uh, it couldn't possibly work works not just well but optimally. So. The optimum data socket ensures ACD. There could be other ways of ensuring ACD. We do it in a coding way, and the coding way allows us to have flex nodes, which are going to ensure optimum use of memory and bandwidth. Uh, and I'm very happy to announce that we just got our seed round, uh, led by 1KX. We have a wonderful, wonderful set of um, investors and also wonderful uh, angels, uh, we've had a really, really good experience, and so here we are, and I'd uh, love to hear your questions. There must be questions. Otherwise, I'll ask you questions. <laughs> Any questions? No? It all made sense. There's a question. Yeah, there's a question. Good. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, what level of redundancy will this add to the data that's being transferred over the network? That's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, just repeat it a little bit more loudly, which is, you know, what's the level of redundancy? So um, in a traditional code, you have to figure out your level of redundancy ahead of time, like a block code, right? Like a read something code. Um, there are codes that, um, you know, create redundancy as they go along, called weightless codes. None of those codes are composable. Here, what's interesting is that I don't need to figure out my redundancy ahead of time. So, and this is part of the optimality. So, whatever resources, you say, hey, look, this is how much I've got for you. That's all you have, that's what I'll take, right? You, but in terms of, is this causing me to send, for instance, more blocks? I mean, for instance, if you think at something like, um, 
you know, uh, like using a read psalm and code, say for block propagation like Turbine does, I think that's kind of what you, you know, if, if I overshoot, I've lost it. If I undershoot, I'm cooked, right? This is not the case here, right? You can, you can use it as a rateless code if you want, right? It works perfectly fine, but I don't have to decide ahead of time, right? But I can keep composing. I can keep composing, that's right. And I don't need to have something like a tree structure. But so the redundancy is basically, you know, if you look at this picture here, if I create this new node, my redundancy is not there for disaster prevention, although it does that, right? And again, this is the worst case, average case. Whatever more, equations I have available, that will immediately create a much faster download, right? So basically, whatever you give me, I will make optimum use of. But I don't have to decide ahead of time, and I don't have to say, well, look, I'm sorry, you know, your code was whatever, you know, 114, 128, and, you know, that's it. And it's like, well, you know, you should have had a 110, 128, and you didn't, so tough noogies, right? Uh, or else, you know, like I gave you a 114, 128, and, you know, <laughs> nothing went wrong. Well, I'm sorry, you know, you paid for it up front and, and you're done with it. So that's a really good question. We, we don't need, you know, the, the redundancy is, com and this is part of the flex node, right? It's completely flexible. Whatever you've got, I'll use. And you'll make, and you'll get advantage of it, not just when something goes wrong, but all the time. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, good. Thank you very much.